Hello, all you hardcores. How are you doing, Julian? I'm all right, mate. I, I smile at that profile picture every single time. Um, I do, but... Merry Christmas. Absolutely, and the same to you, mate. Yeah, same to you. Have you been all right? Yeah, I've been good. Uh, it's just been a, a hectic Christmas. Um, usual family, etc. cetera. Um, carnage. Yeah. Just eat chocolates for the sake of it after training non-stop for months. Eating rubbish. So today's my cut-off day. No more chocolate, no more crap, and then I'm on it tomorrow, mate. Good man. Did you see the boxing show, the Saudi one? I did. Um, I was looking forward to it. And you've all heard this from me several times before now. Yeah. Our, my relationship with boxing is such that I pick it up and put it down when I want it, when I don't want it. I try and avoid all the build-up. I catch bits of it. I, I watch the bits I want. And then I try to avoid the post-fight reaction afterwards because I find that equally as cringe as the pre-fight build-up. But I probably find it, in fact, not equally as cringe. I find it more cringe-worthy afterwards for the simple reason. And I don't want to come across as arrogant in this video. Hopefully, your guys have known me well enough now to know I'm not arrogant, but... I get really frustrated with after-the-fact hindsight experts. And I know from some of the clickbait titles that I've seen and some clips that have popped up that I've not really watched, everybody's an expert after the fact. Very, very frustrating for me. Yeah, well, I had Wilder to beat Parker, but obviously he didn't, did he? Well, listen, you know I, I was on your show a couple of weeks ago yeah. And it's not arrogance. I called the whole card. Yeah, as it, the whole card, as it happened, each fight, the Wilder Parker fight. For me, I said, if you, if, look, I'm not a betting man, but if someone gave me a lump of cash, not my own money, someone gave me a lump of cash, put your money on Parker because the, this is what I'm talking about with after the fact experts. So, I'll, what the bits I have heard and the bits people have said to me in groups and friends of mine and various things and a couple of things I've caught. Oh, Wilder's 38. Wilder's had one fight in two year. Wilder's had two beatings from Tyson Fury. Well, we know that, but we knew that a week ago, didn't we? Yeah. And all these people, all these, sun, what you call these Sunday sermons, the pundits, the guys who are getting paid good money to be experts are all after the fact experts. Now, what you should do is you should be able to break a fight down based on the information you've got at that time, based on your experience, based on intuition, based on everything. You should be able to break that fight down. Now, I thought Parker was a, had a really, really good chance. No surprises in that fight for me whatsoever. But the you know the ones, all these five or six people who are online who are saying... I think what you're trying to say is, for anybody confused, is when these certain people who do the Sunday sermons and the Monday mass, right, after the shows, when they've been interviewed in fight week, they'll say so-and-so knocks him out, but I can see how he can win it, and then so they've got... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah, give they're... you an answer. I went for Wilder and I got it wrong. But, I'm not, I'm but, not, but I'm you not, own that, don't you? I've had, I've had predictions wrong loads of times, but you own it and you say, I never saw that coming. But the thing with the Wilder thing is all I've heard is all week, Wilder is going to iron him out. He's going to iron him out. So what I look at is I'm not a hindsight expert. So I didn't see, I didn't think he would do. So listen, ultimately, right, you deal with the information, what you know. You, you know, you and I chat online and more offline. You know, Russell, irrespective of his age, I've never rated Wilder ever. No, I no, he never rated Wilder. I thought he's got... Pony, but it got him so far, they just kept going with it, didn't they? He had a paper thin CV. This is not hindsight because I said this at the time and got jumped on. He had an absolute paper thin CV. His best wins were against Ortiz. Now, Ortiz, everybody knows his age was never really documented. You only had to look at the guy at the Waynes and Ortiz's face and everything else. This is an old man. This is an old man skills to burn, frozen out because he was too dangerous and who wants a Cuban heavyweight champion of the world who is not going to be able to draw flies to his own dump. There's no interest in that. There's no TV in that. There's no money in that. 
And we we don't want that. Nobody wants that. We want caricatures and stories to be the, the heavyweight champions of the world. So Ortiz was frozen out until he was too old. And of course, an Ortiz five years before, Wilder wouldn't have landed those shots on him. It wouldn't have happened. So he also had some really dodgy early fights early on, his early defences. There was a Polish kid who took him nine, ten rounds. And I've never massively rated Wilder. I've always said to you, yes, we know he's got the massive right hand. But if you look at Parker, Parker, you've got to look at the history of the fighter. Parker did not have a history of being ironed out in one shot. The, the stoppage loss to Big Joe Joyce was a massive juggernaut who came at him and effectively battered him down for 30 minutes. You know, and it, it was a beat down. A huge guy, Styles make fights. But Parker had not had a history of being ironed out. He's shown to be durable. He went 12 with Joshua. Is that a mixture of being durable? Is that a mixture of ring smarts? Is that a mixture of not being prepared to engage in a fight? So I thought... There's every chance that Parker will, will beat him. And I'd said it offline to Max. Um, I says, just on the night of the fight, I says, Parker's going to beat him, buddy. And Max was like, Jules, no way. And after round one, I says, keep watching, keep watching. And it's easier than you think to take that right hand away from Wilder. It really is. And you can say, well, how come 42 people haven't been able to do that? Because you have, a, have to have a little bit of quality in every single area. You have to have a little bit of ring IQ. You have to have good fitness, good boxing fundamentals. And if you look at Wilder's CV, there's been fighters all in his CV who have been great at one thing and not great at everything. But Joseph Parker, unspectacular, definitely not one of the elite two or three heavyweights in the world. But Joe Parker is very, very fit. And the one thing I said to Max, and you've heard me say this, Russell, I always want to see a fighter on the day before or the, or the day of the fight before I'll finally, like, absolutely make my prediction. And what I always look for is the skin. Now, Joseph Parker had a really healthy glow about his skin. And that means he's, he's ready, he's positive, he's relaxed, he's not hyperventilating, he's fully hydrated. Generally heavyweight, it's hard, but he's fully hydrated. And he's had a good camp. And Joe, Joe Parker had a really good, healthy glow about his skin. And I saw him in the dressing room warming up. And I said to my lads, I said to Kelsey, and this isn't after the fact, because you know what I've said to you about this fight. I says, Parker looks really good. He looks really, really good. And in the first round, I, I watched Wilder's legs. And people are saying Wilder's legs are shot. Wilder just has really crap balance. He just has really poor legs. But... His coordination is really awkward and really ungangly, but he just has a fantastic right hand, and it often times that right hand really, really well. But what happened in the second fight with Ortiz, if you if you re recall that, with all people saying, yeah, he's shot to bits, he's ancient, it was exactly the same in the second fight with Ortiz, and Ortiz just got caught. All Parker did was what Ortiz did. Instead of doing it for seven rounds, he did it for 12 rounds. And you have to know when to raid Parker. You have to know when to, to get in there and let your hands go. And you have to know when to tease off. But what was really, really good for me watching that fight was people saying, why didn't Wilder throw the right hand? Where was the right hand? Every time Wilder threw the right hand, two things happened every single time. And this is Andy Lee, great coach in Joseph Parker, great temperament. He either stepped out because what Wilder does and again, this is not hindsight. Wilder has a thing that he does, which Ricky Hatton used to do, okay? Ricky Hatton used to pray. He used to what I call pray. Darky Smith used to say Ricky Hatton prays. And before he launches an attack, Ricky Hatton would squeeze his left glove with his right glove. You know, he'd be there, he'd be, he'd be looking to faint, he'd squeeze, and that was the signal that he was going to, like, step in. He'd either kick his back leg or his prey. Now, if you watch Deontay Wilder, he circles the ring, Left and right, he keeps a range, and then he'll squeeze. He'll start to pray, and he's basically, it's his little signal to himself to say, right, I'm going to unload this right hand. And every time he did that and he prepared to unload it, Joseph Parker did two things. The first thing he did, which is a really good Bernard Hopkins trick, was he just waited for that little moment, and he just teased out. He just stepped away. As soon as you step away, you offset a guy's feet. 
He's got a double step to close that distance down. So it's easier to push off the front foot and move backwards than it is to push off the back foot and move forwards. And again, that's not been patronising. Terry Chapman Dharma will, will kind of tell you that if you speak to him, he'll say, yeah, that's absolutely right. Really easy to push off the front foot and move back. So Joseph Parker kept pushing off the front foot and moving back. And that meant Wilder had to double, double step and he had to readjust. So that's the first thing he did. And that's what you do to draw the sting in the first few rounds. And then the second defensive tactic that Parker used when Wilder threw the right hand was he rolled under it. A simple clockwise roll under a right hand, he rolled the shot because he knew it was coming. And the difference with the push off the front foot and the step out and the roll under is the push off the front foot and step out is more defensive. You're not going to counter the shot. But when you push in and you roll under clockwise, it puts you in range and it puts you underneath and outside the right hand. And it allows you either to smother and to push Wilder's legs back and tire his legs out or to flurry inside. And Joseph Parker did those two things absolutely brilliant. Now, what I'm saying is, yes, Wilder is 38. Yes, he's not the fighter he's, he was, um, if he was ever that fighter. But also the tactics, what I'm saying is the, the real clever tactics that Parker that Parker did and Andy Lee did, they were textbook things that had you had a fighter, you know what I'm saying? Had you had a fighter who wasn't great at everything but good at everything, that's exactly what they would have done to Wilder five years ago. He's not had anybody who's done a... What is Joseph Parker, Russell? He's a, he's a seven out of ten, isn't he, across the board? He does everything. He do not punch massively good, and his feet are not brilliant, but they're all, they're all good. They're all right. It? Yeah, they're all right, hasn't they? And he's got a temperament. And what he also has, which he's is... He's got something to work with, hasn't he? Yeah, and it, what's also massively underrated, and you and I chat about this all the time offline, Russell, is I'm always saying people obsess in the, in the unbeaten record. And what that means when you're unbeaten is you generally haven't fought that many elite fighters. You know, if you look at, we talk about Tyson Fury, a couple of elite wins, nothing else. And if you look at, you know, AJ, similar. A couple of A, a, a victories, rest of B minuses. Now, what Joseph Park has done, he's been in with some good fighters, hasn't he? Now he's been in with the Wilders, the Joshuas, you know, Dylan, the, White. Dylan White, Andy Ruiz. He's been in with all of those guys. Yeah, he's beat some of them. Yeah. He's lost to some of them. But he's also learned what he's not great at and what he's good at. Yeah. And when you have experience and you have losses on your record, losses can be a really good thing because they'll tell you what you need to work on and they'll tell you what you're not so great at and they'll tell you what you should have done but you didn't do. And I think it's it was really... It's, I know we'll move on to Daniel Dubois, but it's a little bit like Daniel Dubois. The best thing in the world for Daniel Dubois was that 10-round hard fight. But that's what he should have had. Before you step up and before you fight the titles and before you're going against these real top kids when you've got no experience, what happened to the days of fighters having hard 10-rounders and win or lose? It's, got, it's about getting experience, isn't it? And Joe Parker now is right up there. Is he the best heavyweight in the world? Absolutely not. Right? Are there three or four heavyweights out there who I think would beat him? Yeah, absolutely. But... He had a real chance in that fight, so it proved. And for me, it was a combination of, I've never really rated Wilder. The fighters he's fought haven't done the right thing against him. He has a paper-thin CV, in my opinion. I've always stood by that. And he's a one-trick pony. And they basically neutralised the right hand. It was a, he's not left hook. He's not left uppercut. The jab's stiff. It's always to the same point. He'll throw 10 to the body, 10 to the head. He never varies it. He never faints it. He never, he never touches it. He never snaps it. He, he throws it at the same power, the same speed, the same two places. So you can neutralize his jab. His left hook's wild and terrible. So he's not a left hand. And all he's got is a right hand. And everybody says, yeah, but what he does with the right hand's amazing. But this is professional boxing. You should be able to neutralize the best weapon of a fighter. So what happened is you got a guy who's a six or seven out of 10 across the board. He's got a very clever coach and they took that right hand away with movies. And people were saying, Park Wilder wasn't throwing the right hand. You don't throw the right hand when the target's not there. 
And when you continually throw it and the guy teases off or the guy rolls underneath it, it stops you throwing it. It stops you throwing it because there's a, there's a consequence every time you throw it and miss it. And he took his right hand away. It was absolutely perfect execution. Really boxed well. His temperament was great. And I don't think it was just down to age. I think a Parker, this version of Parker, would have probably beaten Wilder four years ago, five years ago. And that's my view. And it's not an after-the-fact view because... I didn't think he'd get ironed out. You reckon? And I want to know where all I want to know why all these experts who work with the zone and Sky and these big platforms. I want to know why they're not why they're all after the fact experts. It's it's just frustrating. Oh well, he's uh, he's shot. He had them beat them beatings by Fury. Really took it out of the time. Well, we we knew that. I'm repeating myself. We knew he two beatings by Fury. Yeah. We know he's been inactive. We we know he's been inactive. We we know he's near he's 38 year old. We know all that stuff. And people then still saying, well, he's he's just gonna iron out Josie Parker. And you've also got to say, look, there have been improvements with Joseph Parker. Not huge, but there have been improvements with Joseph Parker. And what do I always say, Russell, as well? Activity, activity every single time. You can't beat activity. You can't beat ring time. Do you think that Wilder blagged a living then as a world champion? Well, it's... When, when Klitschko started to get older, I mean, you know, the Klitsch, Klitschko was... A, both Klitschkos were superb fighters, but they weren't enthralling, and Vladimir wasn't the most exciting. But when... Klitschko was clearly coming towards the end and Tyson Fury had two or three years, two years off. And then, you know, he was slowly coming back against pretty horrendous opposition. There was two or three years, wasn't there, where we had Joshua and we had Wilder. And I always thought they were kind of B-plus fighters at best, both of them. But we always talk about heavyweights. We need excitement. And Wilder provided excitement but I just didn't rate him. It was as simple as that. And like I say, you can watch any videos of me on Porky's Corner. And I said the same thing. Massive right, but I don't rate him. And I never bought into this. And I know Kent feels really strongly about this as well. This hardest punch in every of all time. Do you know what? It's, um, it's what my son who's 15. He always calls it recency bias. It's, it's a phrase that, that young ones must use now, Re recency bias, which is everything what's brand new is the best of all time. You know, this happened with Floyd Mayo, didn't it? Best of all time, TBE, best of all time. Uh, Deontay Wilder, hardest puncher of all time. And if you asked one of these YouTubers who's saying that Deontay Wilder's the hardest puncher of all time, and you said to him, all right, talk to me about, I don't know, Sonny Liston, talk to me about Sam Langford, talk to me about Jack Dempsey, they wouldn't have a clue. They wouldn't have a clue who these people were, but he's the hardest puncher of all time. Statistically, he might have the, the highest knockout percentage of all time, but it's who you're knocking out, isn't it? Yeah. Look at George Foreman, because he's what Kent has Kent's talked about several times. Look at who George Foreman was knocking out, even though Ernie Shaver's never become the heavyweight champion of the world. Look at some of the fighters who Ernie Shaver. Were in men, weren't they? When they were knocking them down. They, they were they were they were taking months off rests and they were saying they'd never been hit like that before and their heads were spinning and all that, weren't they? they? Were proper brutal, wasn't it? Brutal, brutal punching. In fact, I saw some highlights this morning of George Foreman and Jimmy Young. And George Foreman obviously had lost that fight against Jimmy Young. It was a little bit after the Ali fight. But the shots that it was hitting Young with, like massive, massive shots. And unlike Wilder, George Foreman could hit with the left up, the left uppercut, you know, his jab was like just brutal, brutal jab. His right hand, his right hook, his right uppercut. He's just clubbing, clubbing punches. And, you know, the damage that I did to Kenny Norton, you know, the damage that I did to obviously Joe Frazier twice. And even like Ali, you know, the, the, the body shots he was catching Ali with in those sort of rounds two and three to seven. 
just thudding Ali's ribs. They just break break most men in half. And that for me is, I've always said the same thing, elite punchers are elite punchers at the absolute elite level. Now, you know, people are saying, well, he's dropped Tyson Fury four times, but history is now showing, isn't it? Whatever you say about Tyson Fury, it doesn't have the strongest whiskers, does it? No. And Fury had been dropped twice before um, by a cruiserweight and by a very un an unknown fighter, the other guy whose name escapes me, and he's been dropped by a kind of cuffing punch from Ngannou. So Fury doesn't have the strongest whiskers. Ortiz was ancient, said it at the time, it was ancient. There was rumours he was almost 50 in that second fight. And we saw in the first fight, Ortiz almost had Wilder out of there, didn't he? He was an old man. He just couldn't close the show. He's a bit like Vladimir against Anthony Joshua. You get to a certain age, you just can't close the show. And these guys get off. But hardest puncher of all time, not a chance. Um, absolute elite heavyweight, not a chance. Thinnish CV. Um, but it's what we have now, isn't it? When you said, as he blagged a living, I guess it's the... Well, Fury's CV's thin, isn't it? Well, you have to say that, don't you? And this is, you can you can put as much hate in the emails and the comments as you want. You know, I've said Fury's the best of a generation, albeit a very bad generation. But my myself, and I know you feel the same, when I compare this generation, and I compare that to, I'm not going to go back to the 70s and 80s, because I always get told, you know, 70s and 80s, you're, you're obsessed in that. Let's just compare that to the 90s, to Lennox Lewis, Holyfield, Tyson and Riddick Bowe. I know Tyson was 86 onwards, but it was around in the 90s. Michael Mora, those guys. Let's look at this generation of heavyweights compared to that generation. and Look at Lennox Lewis's CV, Evander Holyfield's CV. You, can't, you cannot compare. And I know these guys are still active and there's still fights to be had and the, the career's not finished. You can't compare the skill set. You can't compare the greatness of the fights, and you just can't compare them head, head to head. And I remember when I said on your about two years ago, I said on your show, Russell, I said I think Lennox Lewis would have absolutely obliterated Tyson Fury, and I got some stick, didn't I? I got some serious stick, and I'm like, I'm obviously watching something different to mo to most other people or the Fury fanatics, if you like, and. Whichever way you look at it, Fury's great, brilliant skill set. Um, but the, ultimately, he beat a very, very aging champion at the end of a 10-year reign. It was a dismal fight. He didn't school him. Anybody says he schooled him. All you have to look at is the punch stats. It was one of the lowest scoring punch counts in any heavyweight championship you'll ever see in your life. It was like six or seven punches each around, a bit like the Wilder first fight. And he beat Klitschko. Statement of fact, he tested positive for banned substances in obviously another fight, which kind of like hushed up and then it came to light and he had a ban and he's come back and Wilder's the best name on his CV and Wilder right now ain't looking so special. And for me, a heavyweight champion of the world should not be scraping by on a split decision against a debutant who's never had a professional boxing match in his life. This is just shouldn't, it shouldn't happen. And it did happen and ultimately got dropped. So Fury now can, he can pull that back. He keeps saying, he keeps saying history, and legacy doesn't matter. Didn't kind of fight. He keeps saying history and legacy doesn't matter to him, but then he's saying he's the greatest of all time. So it, it even matters or it doesn't. But ultimately, yep, three or four big, big wins, and he might cement his place somewhere in the lower top ten. But right now, as it stands, it's really looking at under the microscope. The threadbare reigns, aren't they? We've got. You know, Joshua, and the fact that Usyk has moved up and is able to dominate, it shows, first of all, how, how, how great Usyk is, but it also shows that we've got some very beatable heavyweights. So and I think just one final thing, Russell, um, talking about Wilder and Fury and those guys, is what always makes me smile 
is when people say, and I've I've said this, heavyweights now are so much bigger than they've ever been that fighters from previous years, your homes and your alleys, just wouldn't have been big enough. So I look and I say, I, I have a saying which is, size only matters when skill sets are the same, but when you have a great void, a great a massive distance between skill sets, size can become can become quite irrelevant. And then I look at the size of Cunningham, who will drop Fury. Wilder will drop Fury. First fight, what was Wilder? Like 212, 213 pounds. Um, and then Usyk has done a job on AJ twice. And again, he's a former cruiserweight. So what we're actually seeing is that size doesn't really matter, you know, that much when the skill levels are like so so far apart. So anybody who tells me that Larry Holmes and Ali at 200 and whatever, you know, Ali had the pre-Vietnam and the post-Vietnam, but Larry Holmes at 212, 213 wouldn't have been good enough to compete with these guys because the Giants. So first you're talking absolute nonsense. Second, we had a fighter on the card last Last weekend, we had a fighter on the card that was given seven stone and he still won in Daniel Dubois. What did you think to that fight? I thought that was a kind of fight, as I said, the, the Daniel Dubois, they get they get rushed. You know I'm not big on Dubois. I said this when we did the, the preview a couple of weeks ago. I've never been big on Dubois, but I'm even less big on Miller. Um, but I was that was the one fight of the night where I, I got a sore throat because I really wanted Dubois to do a number on him. Um, I thought he showed good punch variety, good discipline. It'll probably look from about the third to the fifth to be having a bit of mild panic as Miller had that kind of little bit of a charge because when you're trying to keep someone off you for the whole for the whole 10 rounds, it was absolutely huge. It's the wrong thing to do. Sorry, no, it's the wrong thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. But what I will say is there was some criticism from some of the commentary that Dubois shouldn't have been pushing Miller off because it would tire him. But I disagree with that because sometimes when you get a guy who's so much bigger than you who comes forward, you have to put him on his heels and sometimes you have to physically push him off. I thought Dubois boxed really well, showed good temperament, a couple of worrying moments, but it was hitting Miller with some big shots because Daniel Dubois can punch. Whatever we say about him, he's got really heavy hands. And then I thought after, I, I knew he would stop him, um, albeit very late on. And I thought after six or seven rounds, Miller just stopped walking forward. And he was giving it plenty of that. But the nose was the nose was gone. It was that kind of thick blood. And I thought it was potentially damage to the nose. And you could see he was swallowing a little bit of that blood. And then I thought Dubois just needs to really step it up. So I thought it was a really brilliant learning fight for Dubois. But as I, as I keep saying... These are the kind of 10 rounders that you need before you fight for championships. And two or three of those, and, you know, he might himself, he might put himself in the mix, but didn't rate Miller, never rated Miller. Very little power, in spite of a good KO percentage because he'd beaten nobody. And anybody who turns in turns up in a ring, sight that, that size is is a disgrace and he ain't got 10 hard rounds in him and Miller's best weapon is his mouth and that and that so hopefully it's good wins to him drug cheat and like he's talked himself into millions of pounds yeah and it's a four-time drug cheat he's a disgrace isn't he he's a he's a disgrace so I as I've said I've not been huge on Dubois but I was like screaming at the TV I loved it when Dubois did him and stopped him I thought it was brilliant because you know, everybody was like sucking up to Gerald Miller, weren't they, for the last few weeks? And I was hearing comments about how he was brilliant, about how he was carrying the promotion, and he was great. And I'm thinking, you see, this is where we're at now, isn't it? Eddie wanted to work with him and all that again. Yeah, we we reward cheats. That's what we do. We we reward drug cheats. You know, the heavyweight champion of the world's a drug cheat, whichever way you frame that. Rapists, rapists. Oh yeah, we we reward them all. Sex offenders, the lot. We re, we reward them all. And you know, it always gets stick when you mention Mike Tyson. And people say Mike Tyson was framed. It was innocent because obviously people were in the hotel room as this happened with Desiree Washington. But this is Mike Tyson who had a 
I went over switched a little bit. We got Mike Tyson, who had a, a litany of various offences, some of them sexual. We all heard what Teddy Atlas said about how he treated women when he was a teen. And people hero worship these guys. This is just what happens, and you will be forgiven for being able to fight or having a big mouth. And we reward drug cheats. And uh, it's and for some reason, you know, the, the the clean cut guys, the good guys, we we don't really care too much for them. But I guess it's a it's an indictment on society, really, isn't it? Bad indictment, isn't it? It's a terrible indictment, mate. It's um. You know, look at talk about hypocrisy. You, know, you don't always go into this, but you've shared with me some of the vile emails you get. Yeah. The vile, the, the horrendous, some of the emails, the, some of the messages you get are just it's shocking, the things that people say about you. But yet, I hope you don't mind me saying, but we've got other, other, other fighters who do far worse things. The heroes, are they? Yeah. We'll forgive people for, you know, we're very selective who we forgive for what aren't we as a society. And as I said, I mean, at one point, I don't know what the what the number is now, but at one point, I think we had a top 10, three, four years ago, and we got like five heavyweights who had tested positive for banned substances, haven't we? Yeah, four. In top 10, there were loads, weren't there? Yeah, there and there. even, yeah, and in a in a in an honest world, a level world, a, a kind of nirvana, those guys wouldn't have ever been licensed to fight again. There were Fury Ortiz, White, Miller, Povetkin. Povetkin, yeah. Five there for straight off. There were another one. Yeah, there were. You're right. well, that it was doesn't... Six in top ten at the time. It, I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that, does it? I mean, you know, as it, it's just a bad indictment on, on, on sport. Um, and if you look at Alexander Usyk... You know, he gets a lot of love, but he gets a lot of hate. He's just such a good guy, isn't he? Just such a, a fun, good guy, a role model. You know, Usyk should be the biggest star in boxing, actually, because he's such a great role model. He's a genuine man. He's a talented fighter. He ducks nobody. He was an amateur. He was just off the scale. You know, he's, he's come up and done what he's done at heavyweight, and, and people still give him, all, give him all kinds of rubbish and nonsense. It's like... We don't want real heroes, do we? We want, we want plastic gangsters as as our, you know, the talk about Conor Ben at some point, maybe part two, but we want plastic gangsters as our champions, don't we? And the, the days of humble, honourable world champions, those those days are seemingly gone. Well, here, here, let me throw these at you here. What have all these got in common? Apart from all being undefeated and never passing a dope test, and never failing a dope test. Bam Bam Rodriguez, Bivol, Usek, Crawford, and I know you. What have they all got in common? Well, they're all they're all good guys, and they don't they haven't they've not kind of embarrassed boxing for a start. And I'm sure that's not the right answer, but they haven't embarrassed boxing for a start. Um, exactly. Yeah, that you just don't hear about it, dear. It's like the. I won't, I won't, you know, I'm not saying everybody has to be angels because this is boxing. People come from a top background. We know that, of course. Tell us something we don't know. But as you've said, for some reason, um, and I probably, you know, I always want to be careful what I say, but I don't know why. But, you know, as you know, I've, I didn't read too much about the Tyson Fury um, ban at the time. I think I was out of love with boxing for a while. You remember me telling you I had two years where I blacked it out when I closed my gym. Yeah, give my, give my boxers the notice and said the gym was closing. I was done, and I had about a two year blackout where I didn't watch boxing, talk about boxing, didn't go on social media, didn't subscribe to Sky and Box Nation at the time. And at that time, I think that was when Tyson obviously was busted, and I think I just didn't really read too much about that that case. And then I spent some time in the last few weeks reading some details and actually catching up on the Tyson Fury case. I mean, obviously it's another video, but it's not great, is it? It's no, it's really not great, and it just never gets mentioned for whatever reason. It never, it never gets mentioned. You know, them five who I've just mentioned there: Bam Rodriguez, Dimitri Bivol, Alexander Usyk, Terence Crawford. 
and that I know you, right? I bet I could dig up videos. Eddie spoke about all of them, where he said they don't do numbers. Definitely, and that's the thing, isn't it? They don't do numbers because they're not controversial. Well, they've all been B side nearly all the time. All of them, most of the time. It took some serious <laughs> time before Crawford got any recognition, didn't it? Yeah, and uh, about Rodriguez didn't carry, didn't carry that show, but it was all about Sonny Edwards. It was all about Sonny Edwards, and we've only really heard about Bam Rodriguez. Well, you don't get a peek at Bivol or Usyk, do you? Well, Bivol's just such a on. I know you. Decent guy. Look at the skill set on Bivol, but he's a good, decent guy. You never hear a thing about him, and it, it, for some reason, people don't want to talk about these. People, I think people appreciate them, but they don't love them, do they? There'll be, you know, if you think about that, there'll be nobody talking about Bivol after that show, would there? The talk is all about Anthony Joshua, um, and how good is, but how good is Bivol? How how good a fighter is he and B to B? How good a fighter are those two? Unbelievable, aren't they? He's another one, B to B, two, four, five. So that's six there. And you make a case for them all to be in top ten pound for pound, all undefeated. And they've had to do the long game, haven't they? They've had to work so long to get the recognition. I mean, we're only really now talking about B to B, aren't we? What is it, 37, 38? Yeah. We're only really sort of talking about in the last couple of years as this elite force. And as I said, bam, 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 you know, we had to watch him absolutely dismantle the best fighter, or probably the pound for pound best fighter we had. Yeah. And talk about dismantle Sonny Edwards. It was just he disarmed him from, from the first two or three rounds. And as you say, nobody's really talking about these guys. I mean, if you think about it, Terence Crawford, obviously we had the big the big spotlight on the Errol Spence unification, but Let's be honest, as soon as that fight's over, he's forgotten about. No yeah. one is banging their hands down saying, what's next for Terence Crawford? Yeah. No one cares. Ooh. We only care about what's next for Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury. No, no one cares about Terence Crawford. Oh. Who's, let's, just, let's be honest, if Terence Crawford retires tomorrow, you have to say that Terence Crawford is an all-time great, don't you? Yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no dis disputing that he's he's an all-time great. He's a Hall of Famer, the whole lot, and it's often life, isn't it? Also, we we don't appreciate these guys, you know, in their prime, and I know they get paid well, but they don't get paid anything like the Saudi money that the big guys are getting. It's uh, it's it's crackers, really. It it really is crackers. You, you can argue that boxing doesn't deserve them, can you? Yeah. Would you add Haney, Tank Davis, J.O. Petia and Shaka Stevenson as other four to that to that six? Yeah, and in your way, I haven't caught with the fight yet. Um, I'm going to catch up with that. I know the result. I'll catch up with that. I'll read We've them got... out. I'll read these. Out, see if you agree. Tank Davis, Haney, Rodriguez, Bivol, Usyk, Crawford, I know you. Better be... Uh, I can't read my writing now. Yeah. Oh, J.O. Petia and Stevenson. Yep, I think I think the... In any order for anybody, whatever, they're all undefeated, aren't they? And they're all... Yep. They're not failed a dope test. They're all fantastic. They're all clean athletes. They're all good ambassadors. I mean, Tank's a bit of a naughty boy, but... They're all superb fighters on their day. I think, uh, you know, Opatea, if that's the right, correct pronunciation, he needs a couple of marquee wins. But I've always said, haven't I, to you, that, that one of the signs of a real elite fighter is when they do fight lower-level opposition, they wipe them out. They wipe them out. And uh, a cruiserweight champion who was just all right would have struggled with, um, you know, the last two kids, Ellis Zorro, and Jordan Thompson, they might have struggled with them or they might have taken eight, nine rounds or beat them on points. And J.O. Patea just, he just wiped them out, didn't he? He just massacred them. And when you can get some, who is probably domestic level, but when you can wipe them, go through them just like that, you're looking very special to me. There's still work to be done with him, but um, his, his hands are amazing, aren't they? His, his hands and his timing is just... 
He's he's almost like a cruiserweight Michael Nunn. He looks 